Okay. Whenever you uh, want, Katina. Obrigada, Vitor and Anna for the, for the. Can you hear me? Hear me? Yes. Obrigada, Anna and Vitor for this um, invitation to to speak to you tonight about my book and my and my work. Um, what I will be speaking about um, is a bit about my thoughts about the archaeology of the Iberian Peninsula, from as the title suggests, from both the perspective of an, of an outsider you know, a person of non-Portuguese Spanish citizenship who trained in the anthropological archeology span of North America, but also as an insider, um, I would say, somebody who's worked in Portugal um, and Spain now for about 40 years. I will also explore some themes um, that came up when I was writing my book, um, The Archeology span of the Iberian Peninsula. Um, and just so you know, I'm actually in Portugal now, um, in Tomar, to be precise, um, where I actually had some of my earliest experiences in Portuguese archaeology. So there's something sort of fitting about all this. Um, it was here, based in Tomar, in 1985, that I took uh, part in the excavations of Juan Zilhão at Caldeirão. So I was a, a beginning graduate student at that point. Okay. So I'm going to start with a, a little personal archaeology, so to speak, a little story, um, maybe to explain to some of you how I ended up in Portugal, which is often a question I get asked. Um, so we have to go back to 1981, a long time ago. Um, it was a Friday afternoon, to be precise, um, in the fall of 1981. It was my senior year at Boston University, where I had majored in archaeology and art history. That afternoon, I was enjoying the company of fellow archaeology students and professors, as well as a glass of scotch, at the campus hangout, which was called the pub. I'm not actually sure if it's still there. I was sitting uh, next to the department chair um, at the time, his name was James Wiseman, who was sharing news of his upcoming trip to Lisbon and his plans for a new archaeological field school in northern Portugal at the Iron Age Castro site of Povoa de Lanhoso. The excavations were to be directed by my advisor, Carl Petruso, that following summer in 1982, and I had planned on participating in that project. But I have to say that I knew nothing, absolutely nothing, about Portugal or about Iberian prehistory at that time. The courses I had taken as a student were, were centered on the archaeology of the Eastern Mediterranean, um, the Aegean, Anatolia, the Near East, classical archaeology, and art history. Not having plans after graduation other than participating in this field school and possibly emboldened by that scotch, I asked Jim, this chair, whether he could get me a job at the Museo Nacional de Arqueologia, which was then under the direction of Francisco Alves. Jim said he would try. And a few weeks later, upon his return from Portugal, he informed me that he had gotten me, secured for me a, a position for about five months at the museum. I was very excited to have my first job in archeology. span I think my parents may have even been more excited than me. Um, after participating in the six-week excavation at Povo de Lanyosu, based in Braga, my crewmates returned to the United States, and I went to Portugal. Uh, went to Lisbon. I stayed behind in Lisbon. I found housing by meeting an employee at the U.S. Embassy, whose parents rented a room in her home in Carcavelos. Lucinda was her name, was a woman of my age. And over the months, we became friends and we are friends to this day. That first trip to Portugal, and particularly those five months at the museum between August of 1982 and January of 1983 were difficult. I won't lie. <laughs> my Portuguese was, was quite poor, um, despite having a Brazilian mother, and many years of Spanish at school. I was lonely. At that time, phone calls to the United States cost 
for three minutes and they were very uh, poor connections. Um, and mail took two weeks to arrive. So some of you may know this, remember these days, some of you may be just too young for this, but um, that's, that's how it was. Um, and the museum at the time was in the process of reorganization. So things were often chaotic. The museum was also cold. It had no central heating and the autumn rains, which you all are familiar with, but I was not, um, produced a chill in that building that penetrated the building's stone walls and all the layers of sweaters that I would be wearing. One of my first tasks as an employee was to record information by hand, of course, there were no computers in those days, um, from the Egyptian collection into the catalog, um, the registry of the museum, which was a large leather bound book that I could barely lift. The Egyptian collection, as many of you no, and may still be, uh, it, it was in, at that time in the treasury, which was a heavily sealed room in the museum. So there I was, you have to picture this, a 20 year old American, the daughter of a Brazilian mother, a Greek father, alone with 4,000 year old Egyptian artifacts at the Portuguese Museum of Archaeology. It was exciting, but also quite surreal. The chill of the temperatures of the museum um, was warm, the chill of the temperatures was warmed by the expressions of affection and attention by many staff at the museum, however, who reached out to me, took me to lunch, they probably felt sorry for me, um, gave me reprints and who talked to me. These people included Olinda Cunha, who passed away a few years ago, and Ana Isabel Santos, even Manuel Faria dos Santos, João Lugero Gonçalves taught me about ceramic typologies. Rui Pereira was my supervisor, and he taught me um, about Iron Age material culture. I sometimes worked alongside Dona Margarida, which some of you may know, who was always telling stories that animated everybody who worked there. At that time, um, there were regular coffee breaks at the museum. Everybody stopped whatever they were doing. They came together, they drank coffee, they spoke, had snacks, um, and then went back to work. And this happened at least twice a day, maybe even three times a day. It was, it was a very nice and very non-American custom. <laughs> Although I had work to do, I also had a lot of free time and I spent much of it in the museum's library. Although my spoke, spoken Portuguese was poor, I could read Portuguese and Spanish well enough. It was in the museum's library that I first came across works that spoke of colonial connections between the Iberian Peninsula and the Eastern Mediterranean during the Copper and Bronze Ages. Uh, now, having Katina, to know sorry, uh, sometimes we lose States. connection. We oh. don't understand you well. Oh, I'm sorry. It's I'm at a hotel, and are you are you hearing me now? Yeah, yes. okay. Yes, yes. Okay, well, I don't know if there's anything I can do, uh, but thanks for telling me. Anyway, I was intrigued by these connections between the West and the East. The problem I later learned uh, was that they were generally wrong, but it didn't matter. I wanted to know more. So I pursued graduate studies at Yale University. My advisor was Andrew Moore who was the specialist in the Neolithic of the Near East, but who had experience uh, working in European prehistoric sites. The tradition at Yale and at many schools at that time was that graduate students in archeology span were to find their own way. Their advisors didn't necessarily have to do what they did. They needed to dig their own sites, and sink or swim on their own. Satina, okay. sorry again. So in the but summers, the, um, the in my early years of graduate school, I went to Portugal and traveled to sea. Um, the connection sometimes what is can really we do? bad. There are okay. phrases we don't, we don't understand well, but OK, okay. Uh, let's, let's wait that uh, uh, the next uh, talk uh, will be better because sometimes okay. the connection is not good. 
sorry to interrupt. Oh, sorry. That's too bad. Um, okay, so I travel to Portugal and Spain regularly um, and to meet people, to meet archaeologists um, and students of archaeology. Um, and it was then I attended my first conference. As I mentioned at the beginning, I worked with Joan Zillian at Caldeirão in uh, 1985, as well as with Richard Harrison um, at the Bronze Age settlement of Monsim. In 1984, I attended the Siray conference in Almeria, which was where I first met the luminaries uh, of that time of late prehistoric Iberian archaeology. People like Antonio Gilman, Bob Chapman, Beatrice Blantz, and Hermann Fritz Schubert. It was in the late 1980s when my interest in the Copper to Bronze Age transition was clarified. I was curious to know what happened after the fluorescence of all these hilltop settlements and the emergence of extensive exchange networks during the Copper Age. In 1986, I went back to Portugal. I worked with João Zilhão um, at a cave site at the base of Agrual, helping him test that site. And one afternoon, he said to me, Katina, at the hill top, at the hill on top of this cave, there is supposed to be a Bronze Age settlement. Why don't you dig that site for your dissertation? And so basically I did that. Um, I returned to Agrual in 1988 and 89 for two six week seasons. And then in 1990, I carried out a survey of the Nabao Valley to look at the general settlement pattern during later prehistory um, for my dissertation research. In 1991, I completed that dissertation. Following those first few years, um, I continued to carry out research in Portugal, which sometimes included Spain as well. I felt that after doing that research in earnings of social and economic life in the Copper Age, in order to better understand what happened afterwards in the early Bronze Age. So I embarked on a collaborative project with geologists of amphibolite sources in the Alentejo and Western Iberia. I started my plaques research, which is basically still ongoing in the early 2000s. I excavated at Bolores, um, a late Neolithic Copper Age um, kind of rock shelter near Torres Vedras between 2007 and 2012. And most recently have been looking at the relationship between um, climate change and culture change. It was also at that time that I began my teaching career, first as a faculty member at Ripon College in Wisconsin, and most recently at the University of Iowa. Many of my Iberianist friends and colleagues help in the Paleolithic or the Mesolithic, and I, okay, my internet is unstable again. I can see that. that. Um, where there's nothing uh, Katina um, you you could maybe try to turn off your camera all of us actually maybe that saves some bandwidth oh, oh okay that's a good idea maybe that helps with the audio that's a very good idea um, let me do that um, sometimes uh, it helps but no guarantees video. okay okay let's try that good suggestion um so yes, yeah, so many of, of my Iberianist colleagues worked in other time periods, but I never really had time enough to read to read their works. Um, it was frustrating. Um, I sometimes taught classes on the archaeology of Iberia, where I was able to do you know to to engage with some of that work, but again, it, it felt frustrating and it felt very superficial. But in two thousand and fourteen, I was kindly invited to present a paper summarizing recent research on late prehistoric Iberia for a conference at Brown University at the Joukowsky Institute for Archaeology. Um, this conference was entitled Archaeology State of the Field. The, the interesting part of that was that each paper had to be 20 minutes long. So here I was, you know, everybody, everybody who was invited had to give a talk 
summarizing a particular time period um, in 20 minutes. Now, that was obviously incredibly difficult. Um, but in doing that, in, 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 in kind of pursuing that challenge of synthesizing a vast body of research, the idea of writing a survey, a more expansive survey of Iberian archaeology came to my mind as a serious idea. Although I have to say that uh, Norm Yaffe, um, an archaeologist who works in the Near, Near East and a, an editor, one of the editors of Cambridge Press, had encouraged me over the years to, to write such a book for Cambridge World Archaeology. Um, so I basically kind of came around to that idea eventually. Such a book I thought would be a useful resource, especially given the explosion of research in Spain and Portugal since the 1970s. Um, since the publication of uh, Hubert Savory's 1968 book, Spain and Portugal, The Prehistory of the Iberian Peninsula, there was really nothing available um, for the Anglophone reader that brought together the rich archeological record for both Portugal and Spain. There were books on Portugal, there were books on Spain, there were regional studies, um, but there was really nothing that kind of brought it all together. Um, writing this book was also a wonderful opportunity to um, you know, read some of my friends' papers. So I put together this book proposal, submitted it to Cambridge Press, and with the support of a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Humanities in 2017-18, I wrote Archaeology of the Iberian Peninsula, and it was published in 2019. Writing the book was, um, as you might imagine, <laughs> incredibly challenging, um, but it was also enormously gratifying. It was actually lots of fun. Um, as it allowed me to visit archeological sites I had long wanted to see, but never had um, the good reason to do so. the rock arts, the cave art sites in Northern Spain, which I had always wanted to do. In many ways, um, writing the book and finishing the book was also a way for me to express my gratitude to all those archeologists um, who spoke to me in that cold museum in 1982, and over the years who have invited me to lunch or dinner or opened up their homes to me, who introduced me to other archeologists who've taken me on site visits, who've supported me and some who've challenged me and answered my myriad questions for over four decades. Many of these people I'm happy to report are my dearest friends um, right now. Some, you know, right here on this Zoom call, um, though of course, sadly, a few are no longer walking this earth. So for the second half of my talk, I'd like to share some of what I thought about and learned about in, in writing the book. I wanted the book to tell three kinds of stories. One was about the work of archeologists, you all, and um, their collaborators, their discoveries, their analyses, debates, and struggles to preserve archeological sites. The second story was to recount the material traces of ancient Iberian peoples and our current understandings of their lives and practices. A third story was the relationship between the Iberian archeological past and contemporary Spanish and Portuguese societies. In the book, I try to demonstrate that these stories are intimately entangled. In recounting these stories, common topics and productive tensions emerged, which seem to be spaces for important research directions in the future. I'd like to turn to these directions, to these, to these themes right now. The first of these, and probably the most salient of these themes that sort of transcends, you know, chronological period is that of mobility. The journeys of people and objects along the river valleys, across mountain ranges, along the coasts, and over the waters that separate Iberia from other land masses. Identifying the presence of local and non-local individuals and goods and determining the role of local or exogenous factors in driving social change have been key questions engaging archeological research in Iberia since the 19th century, as you all know. Recent applications of strontium isotope analyses, genetics, and raw material characterization studies have shed new light onto these important questions, which include, how much demographic mobility was involved with the spread of farming to the Iberian Peninsula? 
what was the nature of the interactions between people in Iberia and North Africa during the third and second, second millennia BCE? Did beaker ceramics have their origins in Iberia and spread to Western Europe? And were population movements involved in their spread? What are the sources for rare materials that ancient Iberians used, such as amber, gold, ferrocite, and copper? Now, there's no, there's no doubt that these are all important topics and questions, given that the biographies of people and objects and their places of origin shape their identities and the ways they are perceived and engaged with. Drawing on ethnographic and ethnohistoric accounts, the American anthropologist Mary Helms argued that goods that derived from distant places derived cosmological potency from that distance conferring political power to those individuals who come in contact with them. This thesis has shaped, directly or indirectly, much archeological thinking on the long distance movement of goods. However, I would suggest that there are other fundamental questions also worthy of further explanation. For example, how was locality and non-locality understood in the Iberian past? And how did these understandings vary by place and over time? As biological sex is distinctive from socially constructed gender, there is no necessary equivalence between biological or geological origins and social identity. One cannot presume that an individual raised in a different geological landscape than the one in which they were buried, which is what we get you know, from strontium isotope analyses, was necessarily considered an other, a social other. This is particularly the case in geologically heterogeneous landscapes, such as Southern Iberia and the Iberian pyrite belt, the Sierra Morena and the Sierra Betica. There, different lithologies may be found within a few hours walk. By the same token, there is no reason to assume that people who originated from the same geological zone who are, or who are all isotopically local saw each other as kindred spirits. Identity and alterity are outcomes of social engagements and interactions of history, which often related to competition. For example, recent isotopic studies from the Copper Age megasite of Maroquias Bajos illustrate this point. Although 8% of the 115 individuals sampled had non-local isotopic signatures, their mortuary treatment was indistinguishable from that of locals. I think it would also be productive to examine the assumptions that underpin the language used to denote people and goods that traveled. Many terms such as migrant, immigrant, or trade good presume a kind of agency with respect to mobility that may not be warranted. In his consideration of the politics of mobility and migration or kinopolitics, philosopher Thomas Nail suggested that everything and everyone moves to some degree. The important questions are how, when, why, with whom, and with what? Did people move with their animals? Did they travel by boat or foot? Were they fleeing violence? Were objects circulated through socially endorsed exchange? Or were they looted or trafficked through socially unsanctioned means? Did women, men, and children travel together or separately? I've often thought that embedded in terms like mobility when applied to people or objects is often implies a kind of middle-class Western ontology, a world in which free will dominates and can be exercised. However, not all people move or stay put as a result of intentional or willing actions. The forced and directed migration of millions of Syrians and Afghans into Europe and more recently Ukrainians, the trafficking of millions of enslaved Africans during the Atlantic slave trade, and conditions of human trafficking that continue to this day are sobering reminders of this flawed assumption. Individuals, particularly children, also run away for various reasons, but often to escape a, a violent domestic setting. Similarly, individuals may not be able to move because of social, political, or economic reasons, or because their mobility is constrained by disability. With respect to objects, Looting and theft must have accounted for the mobility of certain goods, particularly valuable. So we can't always talk about trade. Um, Patrick Geary's study of the trade and theft of human relics in the Middle Ages of Europe provide, 
provides an illum illuminating window into such behavior. It is possible that during the Neolithic, for example, some of the cranial relics, as well as the curated and re-engraved plaque fragments found in tombs were the consequence of such unfair trades. Even animals can be stolen from or escape from the clutches of their owners. Domesticates can become feral. How can we as archaeologists identify cases of these alternative mobilities, so to speak? The second theme that sort of emerged um, while writing the book um, revolved around classification, taxonomies, and what constitutes significant differences or similarities between analytical entities. This concern not, is, of course, not just um, you know relevant for Iberian archaeology, but for you know all all archaeological studies and probably all academic research. Um, this concern has impacted all levels of analysis, including the formal study of artifacts and sites, the temporal ordering of cultural phases the spatial delimitation of cultural areas, and the classification of sites or cultural phenomena into social formations, such as the state versus the non-state. At its heart, archeological theory is about these critical questions of taxonomy. For example, sorry, for example, what are the meaningful differences between the site types of the third millennium BCE, such as monumentalized sites, fortified sites, and ditched enclosures? Is the traditional dichotomization of settlement versus burial a useful one for all times and places? Is it even appropriate to call a place like Valencina de la Concepcion a site or even a megasite when there are so many different kinds of activities and practices apparent over this vast area extending over 450 hectares? Are our conceptions of urbanism as well as social formations too reliant on Western models or on post-contact ethnographic studies. If current site typologies seem unproductive, perhaps different analytical scales should be explored, specifically ones that focus on practice. Artifact typologies also need to be scrutinized, I would say, especially given that multiple functions may be associated with certain types, such as lithics. For example, what does it really tell us to call a beaker a Ciemposuelos maritime or pamela type? What kinds of assumptions are implied in naming a beaker pot by its type? With respect to chronologies, should we continue using terms or having debates over terms such as late Neolithic, Calcolithic, or Epipaleolithic and Mesolithic? What do we gain by calling a site argaric? More importantly, what is obscured? Is it relevant to speak about Andalusia or Galicia or the Portuguese Extremadura for the ancient past? Can we identify cultural cores or peripheries? How well do contemporary geopolitical or environmental zones correlate with cultural pat patterning at different times? Might we begin to explore notions of, culture, of cognitive maps? How might have contemporary polities and administrative units shaped our understandings of the past? Well, while creating taxonomies is obviously essential to ordering knowledge and making comparisons for specific questions to be asked, they need to be critically examined on a regular basis. Taxonomies tend to reify experience and create the illusion of stability and boundedness. In archaeological settings and research, they discourage explorations of the biographies of sites and objects or their dynamic and palimpsest qualities. Tab taxonomies promote the creation of intellectual silos. They encourage a practice of discounting or ignoring exceptions or deviations from the norm. They also encourage a focus on origins and firsts. As historian Mark Bloch noted, an obsession with origins is the idol of the historian tribe. Bloch queried what it means to find the origins of an important phenomenon, as the term is ambiguous, unless it helps us understand a causal relationship that led to a particular development. Rather than seeking the earliest evidence for farming, collective burials, metallurgy, or beakers, it would perhaps be more productive to focus efforts on the factors that led to such early practices, for example, and why they didn't develop elsewhere. There has been a longstanding uh, old debate, the 
state did or not exist in the current stage of Bogberia. You know, I have participated a bit to some of these debates. Um, but they've they've gotten a bit um one way to inject dynamism into our understandings of this time period and others would be to explore the tensions between structure and agency and different kinds of practice. Even the most or contradictory social practices were at play. Can we identify and analyze such evidence for both collective action, cooperation, and exclusionary practices? Another tactic in sort of contributing to sort of the third, second millennia BCE would be to investigate the role of interregional demographic shifts within the peninsula, rather than just outside, as outcomes and triggers of social changes during this period. The growing data on human mobility and ancestry provide a foundation for approaching this question. And I think some interesting um, histories can be generated or will be generated in the future as a result of this. A third approach would be to focus research on household archeology span to discern whether differentiation existed between households and their dead, sorry, existed between households Another uh, avenue would be to explore how the physical spaces that people created for themselves and their dead shaped their own subsequent actions and interactions. Drawing from theories of structuration, for example, how did these interactions shift between the Neolithic and Calcolithic with collective tombs that can be viewed, at least from the outside, by a large group to the Argaric or the early Bronze Age with its intramural burials and more intimate spaces of death? Finally, I would suggest greater attention to non-elite practices, modest graves, and smaller settlements would contribute to a more nuanced understanding of the social landscape of the Copper and Bronze Ages. Given the vast temporal scope of, of the book, um, which spanned over one million years, I was able to explore deeper structural patterns in Iberian history. With this deep time perspective, it became clear that certain places and landscape were foci of human activities for extended periods of time, although not necessarily continuously. These places repeatedly revisited and modified or referenced through architectural citation accrued what I've called mnemonic density. These mnemonically dense places include the Sierra de Atapuerca, Monte Castillo, the Coa Valley, Escural, and Nantiquera. These places are generally characterized by unusual or distinctive mountains or geological features. Monte Castillo, for example, is a conical mountain. Antequera features the dramatic Peña de los Enamorados, which looks like the profile of a human face. Ancient peoples all over the world were often drawn to unusual features in the landscape to situate their sacred places or house their dead. Although encompassing a shorter time scale, many megalithic tombs and caves in Iberia were themselves mnemonically dense places, revisited over hundreds or thousands of years. These places were sites of iterative encounters with the past, the people and their material culture. How did these iterative encounters shape the memories and practices of individuals and groups? I've thought, long thought, and others have thought this too, the distinctive similarities between the geometric imagery of the engraved stone plaques and bell beakers found in these same plaques are striking. Perhaps more compelling examples are some bi-lobed vessels first produced in the early Neolithic of Eastern Iberia, and then again during the early Bronze Age, again of Eastern Iberia. They do not seem to be found anywhere else in the Iberian Peninsula. How did encounters, how did encounters in the early Bronze Age with these older and distinctive shaped vessels, shapers of later groups? Even if one is uncomfortable with the kind of object agency proposed by Alfred Gell, the presence of unusual and old objects very likely provided creative fodder for artists and potentially symbolic capital for groups interested in legit legitimating their existence through ancestral connections. Through the rich burial record of the Iberian Peninsula, we can also explore the relationship between gender and power, while recognizing that burials are not uniformly available due to conditions of um, preservation. With this panoramic perspective, it was striking to me how many special burials are those of young people or females from all time periods. For the, for the Paleolithic, there is of course the Lepedu child and the Red Lady of El Miron. 
for the Mesolithic, there is the older female buried with three Asturian picks from Molino de Gasparin. Particularly spectacular is the late Neolithic tomb of Montelirio, where 20 females were housed in the chamber um, with hundreds of thousands of beads, over 200 arrowheads, and ivory. In the late Copper Age Beaker period, there was a young female buried uh, with a bavid at La Vital and the wealthy female burials of La Magdalena and Camino de las Yeseras. From the early Bronze Age, there is the burial of the 13th of the 13 to 14 year old girl at Santioste with silver beads and an ivory button. Sometimes wealthy females are found with males, such as at the Argaric site of Almaloya. Now, that is not to say that there are no examples of special adult males, uh, adult male burials. From the Mesolithic, there is the burial of Los Azules. From the Beaker period, there is a 17 to 18 year old male at Fuente Olmedo who was wearing a gold diadem on his head and found with 11 palmella points, among other goods. And the Beaker male from Camino de las Yeseras, also with a gold diadem. We can interpret this mortuary record, this, this vast mortuary record, in a number of ways. One, graves are unrepresentative and meaningless as indicators of status of power or power. Two, different ritual practices occurred at different times in the Iberian past. Lavish goods were given to high status individuals at some times or under certain circumstances, while at other times or in different cultural contexts, they may have been material expressions of profound grief at an untimely or bad death or an idealized identity. Or three, women, men, and children all had the potential for achieving high status or being ascribed as high status individuals throughout the Iberian past. Now, each of these statements represents a hypothesis that could be investigated productively. In closing, uh, I just want to offer a few of my thoughts um, about what I see as the future of Iberian archeology, span and, and maybe we can have a discussion about this afterward. First, um, it is likely that funding for archaeological research in Spain and Portugal will be increasingly competitive and pressure will intensify to, uh, upon all of us to demonstrate the relevance of this research to the public and academic communities, both those local to the project as well as um, more globally, um, and must address important questions of international concern, such as climate and environmental change, demographic shifts and mobility, inequality and conflict. This kind of research, these kinds of you know, big question uh, projects will re require teams of interdisciplinary and international specialists, such as what, such as what is underway at Perdigonj, to collaborate and productively engage with scholarly communities, as well as the public through traditional academic venues, as well as social media. The archeology span of late prehistoric Iberia has fortunately ample material that speaks to these issues. Community-based archeology span along the lines uh, of what the team working at Villanova de San Pedro are doing could also be a productive avenue to pursue as this kind of archeology span brings archeologists and stakeholders together in collaborative and mutually beneficial projects. Second, Given increasing constraints on funding, I think it will be important to shift away from major excavations and the excavation of large sites for the analysis of objects and human remains that are already excavated and housed in museum storerooms. Countless objects remain unanalyzed and important sites remain not fully published. In many ways, the stories, I think that the stories that individual objects tell can be more illuminating and more compelling than the stories generated by the excavation of a big site, given their intimate connections with individual people's lives. Um, witness the popularity of the British Museum's podcast, History of the World in 100 Objects. The emphasis on excavation may be a consequence of what um, is perceived by funding agencies as important research. And if so, archeologists may need to make a stronger case for the importance of collections or object analysis. One way to match museum collections with researchers might be for museum curators to disseminate ideas for possible research projects based on their museum's holdings via a website. It might also be productive to develop archeological projects that require lower levels of funding. These could include systematic surveys of river valleys, 
with more explicit sampling strategies and excavations of small sites. Smaller sites can provide key information related to economic and social hierarchies, and they can be more completely excavated and analyzed in shorter periods of time, ensuring more timely dissemination. Third, the development of regional approaches to the landscape has been a productive direction in uh, Iberian archaeology. However, contemporary political entities, such as autonomous communities, do not correspond with ancient political realities and often constrain analyses of ancient territories. Therefore, I think it's critical to ensure that research engages across political, contemporary political or national borders, and, and we need to find ways to incentivize this research since it involves dealing with more layers of bureaucracy. Lastly, I would suggest another future direction would be the creation of central digital repositories to house and disseminate geochemical and photographic information. One consequence of the explosion of new scientific techniques is the production of large data sets, sorry, data sets, which can be difficult to share and compare. Unlike radiocarbon dates, the results of these studies remain highly dispersed and the possibility that archaeologists are duplicating efforts in characterizing source material is high. To conclude, Iberian archaeology has produced a rich record of human creativity, resilience, and cultural transformation spanning over a million years. Given the vitality of archaeological research here in Portugal and in Spain, Many of our interpretations and current understandings will no doubt be revised over time. And a new synthesis and a new book will need to be written and it won't be written by me. Nevertheless, it is my hope that my book provides a helpful summary of the state of the field and a framework for developing directions for future research. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Ok. Certamente a Ana Val vai agora abrir a discussão. Não sei se ela está a ouvir-me. <laughs> But uh, if she is not here uh, for the moment, uh, I will ask uh, the audience who wants to speak to ask questions to Katina. She has raised a lot of very interesting questions. So it is very stimulating for all of us to uh, discuss with her, taking this opportunity for the best. Uh, well, if no one steps in, steps in, may I pose a question? Hola, Andre. Hola. <laughs> well, it, it, it's not directly related to your presentation, but since you started with bio biography uh, with the bio notes, I'm just curious. From all these years that you've been working in in Portugal, what would you say is is what would you say are the major challenges that that uh, that the archaeology in Portugal uh, is facing from from your own experience. What is more difficult? Is it the bureaucracy? Is it you know uh, motivating and building teams? Yeah. What what is what do you think could be improved other than those four those you have you finish with those four lines of research? But on a more practical level, based on your experience, what do you think that you know that we could all help with? Well, that's a that's a great question, Andre. It's nice to see you. Um, um, I worked with Andre, by the way, in Torres Vedras. Yes. Um, well, I, I think you've sort of you you've kind of nailed it right there. I mean, the bureaucracy um, it, it has gotten worse, has gotten more um, ponderous, has become more difficult. 
Um, and it and it changes, right? And, and I mean, you all know this. I don't have to say. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But you know, when you're a foreign, you know, archaeologist, and you're trying to like plan, <laughs> and you're basing your knowledge on what you did the year before or two years before, and then the rules change. I mean, it's it's just really hard. It would be nice if the rules of engagement, the sort of the, the criteria to write reports or to write, you know, to get permits, like kind of stay sort of the same, you know? I mean, I, I don't think life needs to stay the same, but just like kind of stick to the rules for maybe 10 years or something so that we can just like wrap our heads around it and, and sort of plan. Um, I mean, I, I will confess, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I will confess that I've basically kind of given up digging in Portugal in large part because the bureaucracy like has just, just became too difficult for me and too stressful for me. Um, I can't, I can't run a project. I, re I don't want to run a project anymore. I mean, I just, it's just too, too hard. Um, and um, and again, the rules kept on changing. So so again, I don't think that's anything you can do something about, right? But I think this is a you know this is the power structure, of, you know, that has to kind of maybe be attentive to that. Um, you know, that's that's become a challenge. Um, I think. I mean, I realize that. I don't know what you mean about building teams. I mean, it's it. I've always found great collaborators here, and you know, willing participants and projects. So I've never that's never been sort of an issue. Um, I think the main issue is just like you know the bureaucracy of running projects. You know, everything like even as, when I was a a grad student, which I know seems like a long time ago, we didn't need permits to do survey. Like I bet I did the Nabon survey. I don't think there was there were permits required for sur for survey. You know, I mean, the material was collected; it was all deposited. You know, it was fine. But now, even per you know, surveys require permits, and that's you know, and I kind of understand some of the reasons for that. You know, sort of control over materials and make sure people are not duplicating efforts. You know, I I understand that, but it really kind of kind of makes it hard to do research and to ask interesting questions that are that transcend um, administrative borders. I mean, you've probably seen this too, Andre, in your own GIS work, wouldn't you say? Uh, yes, yes. I, 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 I was kind of expecting you to share that experience, but um, I, I think it's something because I'm not actually an archaeologist, I'm kind of an intruder here uh, in a way. But uh, what you just said, it, it it kind of makes me think that what opportunities is 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 the field missing because as you i can imagine that other research researchers might also feel intimidated if you with with the with the experience you have from the country basically said you know uh, it's just too much of a burden i can imagine like a, a completely new researcher uh, he's going to feel completely overwhelmed maybe we are missing opportunities because of that that is my takeoff from from your um, from awesome. your answer. I think I think I mean any researcher, you know, international or local, may just feel like overwhelmed by the bureaucracy. Um, and you know, I guess what you could do is like just give up, or you do things on the sly. You know, I mean, I don't know what yeah. why, but it's it's hard. You know that. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I think the other thing, Andre, just to kind of add to some of that, I mean, I mean, I often am asked to review articles um, uh, that come from Spanish and Portuguese um, archaeologists for journals, for you know, English language journals, and I think one one um, suggestion, I, I think, I'm not a suggestion, but one thing I would I, I I often say in my my comments is that you know the articles are often written without the understanding of what an outsider might under know about Iberia. Like it's it's you know the articles are often written for a, a more a small audience of people who already know you know Portuguese and Spanish archaeology. Um, I think it's really important for young people, sure. particularly. Who you want mean to like sorry to interrupt. You mean like a lot is assumed from the reader. Right. Exactly. A lot right. is. Um, and not, you know, it's not explained, and and the larger implications of the of the research are not often made explicit. So, you know, 
it's unclear to the reader, I mean, to a non-Katina reader, like why, why this is important. So I think, you know, it, what I think is happening is that, you know, people, people are, you know, have spent so much time on sort of managing, you know, their local rules and the bureaucracy that there's not the energy to kind of look more globally at the bigger picture, the theoretical implications, the implications to cultural knowledge, you know, throughout Europe, for example. I don't know if that's clear. But. I would like yeah. to, to say something if uh, there is no other people now uh, wanting to intervene, uh, waiting for, for other people to intervene. I would like to say that, uh, well, first of all, I didn't read the book by Katina, this last book, and uh, I got very curious to, uh, to read it because it is it seems made of the same structure of the of this um, talk uh, it is made of questions and i mm -hmm. always liked or preferred questions to answers uh, mm -hmm. in the sense that of course that is the questions that mobilize us to to go on to to uh, develop our our thoughts i knew katina i must say in Chavish in 1990, I think, when she appeared, I didn't know her before, she appeared at the excavations or near the excavations we were doing uh, in Chaves, in the north of Portugal, and she invited us to participate, me and my ex-wife, to participate in a um, session of the uh, American Anthropological Association she was preparing about mm -hmm. Iberian uh, prehistory. Mm -hmm. And so it was my first uh, occasion to go to the United States. Uh, it was something I, I need to, to uh, thank to Katina, this opportunity that in 91, we were there in Chicago, remember? Mm -hmm. I do remember. <laughs> One of the problems <laughs> Uh, I have with uh, uh, archaeology, of course, and uh, one of these uh, last days I was uh, in Lisbon, I, because I live, I live now near Lisbon, I was in Lisbon listening to Philippe Descola, a friend of mine. He is a French anthropologist, a very renowned anthropologist with many works translated into English. And um, uh, one of the things I I come to my mind when I compare the work of anthropologists with the work of archaeologists as myself, or with prehistorian archaeologists as myself, is that we um, tend to uh, think about big unities of time, big unities in general. And uh, when we go uh, to uh, field experience in anthropology, what we see is precisely what you told, talked about. Uh, it's a surprising reality, first of all. We uh, need to transfer ourselves to another way of reasoning and our uh, representations of the world are completely disturbed because we enter into a another reality, it's another reality, or in archaeology, it's difficult to do that, especially in prehistoric archaeology, of course, because we need to tend to, to project in the past our own representations, even, we do, even if we do that critically. And the, the re social reality is so fluid, is so... Uh, uh, particular, so peculiar, that uh, it, of course, uh, it poses me a problem as an archaeologist when I am excavating a site um, with colleagues, because I, I am convinced that, of course, archaeology is a teamwork, and uh, with colleagues and uh, with colleagues directing with me. Uh, the excavation, because I, I, I don't believe in the isolated uh, teacher or professor or 
or director of an excavation with his students or collaborators in a secondary position. No, I, I think that the teamwork needs to uh, start at the direction level because there are several ways of looking at things and mm -hmm. the discussion is very important even if sometimes it creates even a, a certain a certain <laughs> problem but yeah. uh, that problem is very important because we need to uh, not be too much convinced of our of our own prejudices mm -hmm. but uh, um, when i am in an excavation uh, and i am before uh, static reality uh, that I want to interpret, to interpret, uh, and I think that in the past it was not static at all. Each minute, each afternoon, each day, each uh, week, so to speak, in modern terms, of that population created continuously new things, and what did we uh, do to make uh, prehistoric archaeology? We have projected in the past the cultures, the, the blocks uh, of something that we assumed not to change with time. Or in fact, in social reality, everything is always changing, even if it is changing in a not noticeable way. So it's a problem mm -hmm. of, of prehistoric archaeology. Not, uh, I'm not speaking about historic archaeology because for me, historic archaeology is another, is another matter, is another science. But prehistoric archaeology causes or so raises that problem. Uh, how to uh, capture, of course, it is impossible. And we need to live with that impossibility. So what we do is to uh, discard permanently uh, interpretations that we, uh, by our own experience, human experience, life experience, for instance, now that I am 75 years old, I don't think just like when I, I was 40 or 30, my experience of life told me many, many things, but also uh, the, the everything that, that I can read being, for instance, now retired, I can read things that uh, awake me for the extreme complexity of each reality, be it historical, be it social or not. Uh, it's incredibly, incredibly complex, any situation. And we tend to, when we have a, a site, you know, we have a funding, funds to, to to use and we have a certain time we have students that ask questions to us we need to answer we need to be attentive to a lots of problems and uh, it's always a precipitation what i feel it's a precipitation we need to uh, uh, rapidly go into some kind of conclusions mm -hmm. sooner or later for instance, the, the case that we are studying in Vila Nova de Foscoa uh, municipality, Castanheira do Vento, that I was talking with you before the, your talk. It's a very huge site. And uh, I'm convinced that the first, the first, the first, I don't want to occupy too much time, but just to say this, the first um, experience I had in Portugal that opened my eyes to what is a real good important excavation it was in 68 with the Germans mm. uh, in Zambujal near Torres Vedras mm. uh, a site uh, an excavation that was directed by, by my friend uh, Schubert Hermann Fritz Schubert and uh, we had, we were probably 50 people there, I don't know. But um, there was, this was organized as a machine, you know, because they, they were not um, 
allowed to take the findings to Germany to study. So there was always people there washing, uh, well, uh, washing the material and uh, uh, every 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 step of the archaeological process needed to be made in situ there. <laughs> and it was uh, an enormous team. And uh, I think that it's only that way that we can, uh, that we could, if we had uh, money, if we had means, if we had uh, a good, good teams, good teams would be, would be easy to have if we could have money and the uh, funds and the uh, inf infrastructures. Uh, we need to work for a long, long time before raising any problem or any question. Uh, and uh, work hard, not only, of course, in survey and uh, visiting the excavations of our colleagues and reading the literature, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but also to have a, uh, 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 an excavation of an important site. Because, for instance, in Castanheira do Vento, what we have is the fossilization, so to speak, of a conception of space that doesn't exist anymore. Mm. We, we know the conception of space of the Romans, for instance, but we don't know practically any conception of space of the people of the Copper Age, third millennium before Christ. We don't have. And as many of my colleagues tend to classify these sites, as Castanheira do Vento or Castel Velho, that was the first one to be excavated in that, in that region, as fortified settlements, settlements made in the top of the hills for defense, of course, they depart immediately from a conclusion. They depart from the, something that they should prove first. And as they depart from an idea, a previous idea, preconcept, of course, they uh, are going to direct all the excavation according to that idea. And they discard many, many, many things. They can be observed in the field because of that preconcept. Yeah. So, uh, of course, we all we all have preconcepts. We can we can't. Uh, we are not empty guys that go to the field without any uh, preconcept. Of course, we have always preconcepts, but it's the, one of the uh, useful things in a direction team, a collective direction team, because at least we are four or five to have preconcepts and we need to negotiate between us Mm -hmm. which is the best preconcept to be applied to that moment. Of course, these sites like Castanheiro do Vento or Castelo Velho, or I would, I would say uh, the other sites of the uh, Lisbon Peninsula, the Portuguese Extremadura, or other sites even in Alentejo of this some kind, uh, are uh, not, of course, made for defense were not made for defense, were uh, most probably uh, sites for uh, people to meet and to proceed to some kind of ceremonies that asserted their common identity. Mm -hmm. For instance, of course, it's a preconcept too, but I mean, I suppose that this preconcept, this idea is more useful than to think of these sites as fortified sites like medieval castles or uh, late Bronze Age, Iron Age sites for defense. Because we know sites, of course, uh, even here in Alentejo, uh, that were no uh, defense possible classified as that. Uh, uh, I would I would give the, the example. Of course, there is now a, a great uh, excavation by our colleague Antonio Valera and uh, his team 
in uh, Perdigões, in the Regengos de Monserrat. It's a very, very important work and is not uh, made, uh, is not uh, uh, organized, is thought according to the idea of fortified settlements. It's impossible to speak uh, about the fortified settlement uh, of uh, Perdigões. Perdigões, it's a complex site uh, that has no uh, fortified in, in intention. And the, most of the things, I, I, I will finish very briefly. Well, <laughs> Sorry, it'll be so ask, long. Other people ask questions if they have anything to say. Of course, but uh, we ask first people if they have questions okay. and nobody, well, some... except okay, one, maybe... Andre Mano, uh, but uh, I will, we will have time. Um, just to finish. Uh, I think that uh, prehistoric archaeology is a science like any, any other one. Uh, we all uh, need to deal with holes, with ignorance, with uh, failures, with uh, things that we can't absolutely can't reach. Mm. It would be our desire to, to understand but we can't understand or at least we are going to discard the history of prehistoric archaeology is to discard nonsense theories or nonsense interpretations and to retrieve the interesting ones for the moment but maybe these interesting ones for that moment will be discarded in the future or by others That's and right. this is the process of knowledge in this discipline and i i will finish here, not to take time to the others. Okay. But so somebody, Gilles, uh, I'd like to ask on the question uh, whether you think it is easy for foreign researchers to undertake archaeological fieldwork. Is it hard to find information regarding this bureaucracy? Um, so Gilles, I think I mean, yes, <laughs> the answer is yes, I think it's difficult. Um, I think it's probably the best the best suggestion I would make for anybody, you know, a non-Portuguese who wants to work in Portugal is to collaborate with a Portuguese who understands the bureaucracy. I think that's the that's the best way to that's the best way to handle such a situation in the future. Um and uh I mean, I know it's all on the website and everything, but it's still, you know, when you're looking at from the outside, you know, this doesn't, it's not transparent. Um, so yes, it is difficult. Um, yeah. Does anybody else have a question or anything they want to say? You can also write me, you know, send me an email and we can chat that way too. I know it's getting late. It's like my bedtime coming up here. <laughs> Well, maybe Vitor, we should we should wrap things up. Um, thank you, Vitor. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, and again, I hope you know if you have questions, just email me. I'm here in Portugal also for another month or so. Maybe I'll see you. Um, um, Katina, I need first to ask to thank you very much for your presentation. It was very very stimulating. Uh, I liked it very much. I'm going to buy your book. To read it as soon as possible. <laughs> I made a, I made a publicity in my Facebook of all your books. Uh, to, uh, to be frank, I need not notice before that you have published so many. So uh, congratulations for your your work, and uh, I'm going to uh, ask Anaval if she's there. I don't know what happened because Anaval is the, you know. Um, person who conducts this session so she is um, recording the session and she should uh, finish the session or ask people what i am asking if there is someone who wants to raise questions uh, Vito, can Katina. i just can i just interrupt this is joanna here sorry my camera is not working i think anavala is not available right now she just messaged me to ask if everything was going uh okay so just just to say that i don't think that she's 
av available right now. Um, Good. Go on. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't, it was just, just to put that bit of information there because uh, I think that she's not, at, you know, next to her computer at the moment. But anyway, Katina, thank you so much for, for the talk. It was great. I thought that there were some really um, topical themes that you, that you touched upon. And um, it's interesting because I think that I, you know, being outside, because obviously I'm kind of, I have this dual situation now, I'm not really living in Portugal or anything, but I think that um, sometimes some, some of the information that you were talking about doesn't really reach me. And obviously I, I kind of still have some ties to Portugal. So I thought that it was really interesting how you were kind of putting everything together. Um, mm. Yeah, and I was, I was wondering if you, if you have any plans to translate the book, because I'm not sure. I think the other way, you know, I think that sometimes, um, or most of the times, or a lot of times, research from Iberia doesn't really reach outside. But I think that, you know, the other the other way is also true. So I know a lot of people here who actually work over Iberia, but you know, researchers in Iberia don't really know that others work on the on these topics as well, and so they don't really go and look for them or anything like that. So I think there's a two way kind of um, issue here and there's lots of work being done everywhere I just think that there's uh, some lack of communication sometimes um yeah Joanna you ask a good question I actually uh, it, I mean the book was published like right at when COVID began <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is good and bad um I mean it made it in in the nick of time but it also meant that you know I, I contacted a, a person a publisher about a translation and and she never wrote back to me I wrote a couple yeah. of times um, I mean, I, I would love to have the book translated, but I'm, I haven't really been successful in finding um, a publisher for that. So um, if anybody has any ideas or mm -hmm. has anybody in mind, I would, you know, in, in Portuguese or Spanish, of course, I, I would be thrilled. Yeah, I think most people will understand English anyway, but I think, you know, it's always different when you read it in your, in your own language. The understanding is always a little bit different, so... Absolutely. Oh, there's Anna. So <laughs> Anna's back. So well, Joanna, I mean, you must feel some of these things, same things of being sort of an insider outsider. I mean, you're from the other way, right? You know. Uh, I yeah, I, I I feel very much like an outsider most of the times these days. <laughs> um, but yeah. But that gives you a perspective. I mean, I'd like to think that that sort of liminal status of an insider outsider gives us, you know, maybe. I think so. I think so. I think I'm more aware of um, maybe the potentials and the limitations on both sides. You know, I, I'm I'm very aware that um, you know the 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 barriers of language I think are very real. You know, um, even for myself when I'm kind of looking at at things in other in other countries, I always I'm always so aware of 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 the language barriers and how much information I'm missing out because I also see that happening with uh, people researching Portugal or Spain and how much they're missing for not reading things that I know that they should be reading. Mm -hmm. um, so there is there is a, a big part of that. Um, yeah. yeah, not everything is not everything is in English. Um, yeah, exactly. Or, exactly. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Anyway, we'll get there. <laughs> I'm happy to see Anna here because uh, for a long time I was trying to connect her uh, because she's she's the person who is uh, ruling ruling here uh, the, <laughs> the meeting and the the uh, recording of the session uh, yeah and uh, I told uh, I spoke about our site Castanheiro do Vento mm -hmm. and you were not here unfortunately and uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, I would like to, because uh, of course uh, the situ the problems raised by Katina are so vast, so important. I told her that I'm going to buy the book to the her book to read it uh, as soon as possible. It interests me very much. I always was interested by uh, questions, uh, questioning the 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 reasoning of my of myself and my colleagues because in prehistoric archaeology we uh, are very dependent 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 of uh, the theoretical framework we we use 
very dependent. And uh, most of the time we uh, are importing anthropological uh, theories and uh, uh, you know, uh, frameworks to prehistoric archaeology. And uh, we never export from prehistoric archaeology to other, to other sciences uh, anything. And, and that disturbs me a lot. Um, but uh, if we, if we uh, really think about the so-called archaeological record in prehistoric archaeology of Iberian Peninsula, it's very hard the sites that are entirely excavated, entirely studied. See, for instance, the problem of um, Los Milares. Los Milares is a, a site that was extensively excavated, but uh, and I, I hope that now it, it 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 is in a better condition because it was like abandoned for a certain time, and uh, I saw it with uh, with my colleague from the Granada uh, University in. Uh, 85, uh, the so-called fortress number one just finished to be excavated. There was a plane coming from Madrid taking photos, aerial photos, to the so-called fortress number one. It was so incredibly well excavated and so incredibly visible that it looked like people that lived there or made things there had abandoned that the previous day. They had everything clean for the aerial photography of that time. It was fantastic. Uh, and even the site, we were a long time with uh, Trinidad, Trini and uh, Molina, Fernando Molina in the site discussing the excavations there. That interested us a lot. But the last time I went there, it was raining uh, and the, the site was in a certain kind of, uh, of decay. I hope that now uh, it, will, it will be better because there was someone there as director that I had known in, uh, in, the, in one of these uh, motillas the Motilla of Azuer uh, in, uh, in Spain. And um, he was the director of uh, Los Milhares. But even Los Milhares, how many problems uh, it, it, it raises. And uh, you told uh, Katina about the need to study small sites. Of course, it's easier to, to study a small site when we have not lots of money, but how can we uh, understand the network of sites of a region if you don't, we don't have different scales of sites studied and into, put them into connection? It's well, practically impossible. I, I'm not saying that we should ignore the big sites, but I think there is an emphasis in a kind of a, an attraction, you know, for many reasons on the biggest and the best, right? But obviously the world is made up of different kinds of site, site sizes and different scales of, you know, uh, aggregation and population sizes. And so we don't really know much about all the smaller stuff, right? And, and, I, and it's not just that it's easier. I mean, they're important. I mean, people live there, right? If we want to no, understand social differentiation. I, and, I agree with you. We the have problem to. is that we don't know much also about the big sites. That's the problem because they are not enough excavated. Yeah, no, that's, that's the problem. Or they were excavated in old times according mm -hmm. to, to uh, methodologies that are completely out of date, mm -hmm. uh, that have no, no sense at all. I don't, I'm going not to speak about uh, cases that... Uh, uh, practically go into the into the destruction <laughs> uh, 
systematic destruction, destruction of sites made by amateurs. But uh, of course, even the sites that were well excavated, hmm, how difficult it is to have, to have a, an idea of those sites. And then, of course, we would need to study sites of different scales. For instance, our friend, who is not here, unfortunately, um, João Muralha, uh, made her his PhD about Castanheira do Vento too. But uh, he also uh, made very much survey in the region of around, and he found different uh, sites of the same age of different scales. How can mm -hmm. he ever excavate one of these sites if even for a small scale excavation in the huge site we are studying since 98, he has practically a few students and not much money. It's very, very difficult. We should have, uh, in Portugal, there is a problem about, about archaeology and especially about prehistoric yeah. archaeology, because of course, the archaeology of Lisbon, we have now, uh, we know now the importance of Roman uh, Lisbon, of uh, the importance of, uh, you know, Bracar Augusta, the importance of, uh, you know, uh, Merida, uh, <laughs> or Merkler, I mean, etc., etc. Uh, nobody uh, raises any problem about those sites. They are visible, they are inclusive. You, you, can, you can sell tickets for people to, to, to visit these sites and to organize a, a, a visit of these sites. But the question is, the prehistoric sites as, as have no such visibility. Mm -hmm. And it is very important to educate people to understand that we, we are very, very much, you know, turned into a, a society of the image, of the spectacle. Guy mm -hmm. Debord uh, told that a long ago, the society of spectacle. And uh, mm -hmm. how can we uh, show people something that is no spectacular at all? And how can we convince people, for instance, mayors or people in the municipalities who, who want to, uh, of course, have a very monumental place to show the visitors, etc.? How can we convince them to give uh, funds to a place that uh, has no uh, monumentality, monumentality at all? And also, mm -hmm. In Portugal, there is no public interest by archaeology. This is a very endemic case. It's very important to, to, to say this, because you see, when the Coa Valley was discovered, and we know now that the Coa Valley and these Paleolithic engravings are the most important heritage, archaeologic heritage in the Portuguese territory, by far, we are the only country in the world that have such number of Paleolithic open air engravings. It's a fantastic place. Of course, the Spaniards, our colleagues in the other side of the border have Siega Verde, but Siega Verde is just, has just uh, uh, some hundreds of of, of engravings. We have many more in, 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 in a most diff different landscape. It's, it's a huge landscape. So uh, the discovery of the, the Coa Valley was so important of the discovery and the study of Lascaux or Altamira. It was a revolution in our idea of seeking prehistoric man, a complete revolution. And how many archaeologists at that time, it was in the middle of the 90s, 95, 94, 96, mm. how many archaeologists moved to defend the place from the dam? Because there is no public interest in Portugal for archaeology, and that continues to be that. Uh, it this, this is an endemic question. 
Anna, you want to speak? I'm no, I, I just want to say that maybe that will be the topic for uh, uh, another discussion and um, another session of uh, of uh, of CAP. Uh, and I think it's up to us to to change uh, the way archaeology is perceived by the general public, uh, anyway. But um, I think yeah, people are leaving, so maybe we should uh, end the the session. Um, and uh, I'm really grateful to you, uh, uh, Katina, for for your presentation. There's lots of messages here in the chat saying that your talk was uh, amazing um so uh thank you thank you very much and uh, thank you to you all uh, and good night thank you thank you very much katina okay obrigada it was a pleasure era, era, foi um prazer rever-te e agradeço